Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Practical Liberty. My name's Henry Bingaman. And as you know, um, one of the things I'm always talking about for people trying to get into a freelance career or start their own business is that you are your first client. You are your most important client and you need to take that responsibility seriously. And there's a lot of different ways you can go about treating yourself well. Um, freelancing is obviously what I talk about, but there's a million, a million ways to kind of find freedom in your life. And one of them is affiliate marketing. And today's guest is really an expert in affiliate marketing. He's worked with Michael Hyatt, uh, who else? Tony Robbins, Stu McLaren, Jeff Walker, the list goes on and on. And of course, our very own Tom Woods, who's uh, how I first heard of him on the Tom Woods show, Matt right. McWilliams. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. Hey, Henry, thanks for having me, man. I'm, I'm excited because I get to say things I don't normally get to say today, kind of like when I go on Tom's show. <laughs> you know, uh, it's like all, I have a friend of mine that's uh, uh, he's he's been a Tom fan and he, he knows of you as well. And, you know, for about 10 years and he uh, he actually works for us now. Uh, okay. I'm not going to mention his name just for various reasons, although if anybody knows my company, they know exactly who I'm talking about. And this guy actually like we're you know, we're in business together. But how he first came across me was a tweet that I sent during, I think, the. I think the 2012 campaign right after Ron Paul finished second in New Hampshire. And I sent this tweet out and he was like, I should follow this guy. He's like a marketing guy, but he talks about Ron Paul. That's cool. So he like follows me next thing, you know, you know, fast forward, like six years later, he's working for us. And so we, we have this running joke because we send each other the memes that we wish we could post to Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so we're each other's like private Facebook. And so this is going to be like my private Facebook today, like my private podcast where I get to say all the things that I never get to say on my own podcast. And it, uh, so it'll, it'll only be heard by a couple thousand people. So yeah, totally <laughs> private. Don't worry. Everything's just between yeah, us and SNR and the but listeners. My point is like, I get yeah. to, I get to do those things, you know? So I can say Ron Paul and nobody goes, who? <laughs> um yeah the, the my audience does know ron paul so we, we, we're so. good there uh <laughs> so i want to get into a little bit of your story because you've had yeah. uh several lives it feels like from reading your book so i just I finished have. the book that's uh standing behind you turn your passions into profits it was i was surprised at how much i got out of it even at my, you know oh, i've been cool. doing this for 16 years and i'm still going through and going, oh yeah, that's a good idea. Even the stuff that's just a reminder, like uh, yeah. for, for example, one thing that I haven't been doing that I need to do more of is go live. It really, it bonds you to your audience. It brings in new names, it brings in new attention. And it's such an obvious thing, but you point it out. And it's one of those things that that's easy to forget no matter how long you've been doing these things. There's a million ways to forget to do marketing. And, and a lot of the stuff you had in your book was really helpful yeah. to just be a reminder. I'll tell you, I, that's, I've heard that from a lot of people, like some of my friends that I had read the early manuscripts, are not the target audience. They're just not like, I wrote this. I mean, as the title suggests, I wrote this for somebody who's not currently turning their passions into profits. Like who wants to read a book about things that they've already done? You know, <laughs> it's like, it's like giving the book about how Apple became Apple to, you know, Tim Cook. Like who want, he doesn't want to read that. You know, it's not interesting. The thing that surprised me, because I wrote this for beginners and people who are starting their online marketing, you know, want to start an online business. Um, I wrote it for my daughter, you know, in a sense. She's 12 years old and she's starting her first business. And so she's been reading the book. And yet the people who read it and then would text me, I, I, had, a, I had a friend of mine. So I'll give you one example from step four of the book. It, it talks about, you know, turning subscribers in, or visitors into subscribers. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, you know building a lead magnet and growing your email list. And we can talk about that, of course. But and he texted me and said, dude, I read your book. Um, I told my team, oh, my gosh, we're not doing this. Like this guy has about a I don't know, one point two, one point three million dollar a year business, not massive, but plenty cool, you know, like five, six team members. And he said he texted me about three, four months later and said, dude, you're not going to believe this. Our opt in rate is up 40 percent we've grown our revenue by the same amount in the last six months. Like he went from a 1.2, $1.3 million business to almost a $2 million business from reading. And he, he was like, I had no intention of getting anything out of your book. I was reading it for typos. <laughs> you know, I was reading it to make sure that, you know, it was coherent to, you know, people. And he said, and he, he was not, he didn't read the whole book. He wasn't supposed to read it. He ended up reading the whole book, but he wasn't supposed to read the whole book. I gave like each person like two chapters, you know? Yeah. And he read that and got so much out of it. He ended up reading the whole book and he was like, it, it transformed my business. I was like, dude, you're not even the target audience. I did not write this book for you. How is this happening? And he's like, it's because when you've been in business for a while, you forget the simple things. You forget the basics. You forget the building blocks. I have, 
half the stuff I wrote in the book, I wrote that book four years ago. That's the thing people for, I don't realize I wrote it almost four years ago. Well, like actually I've forgotten half the stuff I wrote in it. So when I do interviews like this and you remind me, I'm like, Oh my gosh, I haven't gone live in three months. <laughs> Oops. You know, so it's good to get those reminders. Well, and for the reason that I think I got so much out of it, and I wasn't, no offense, but I wasn't expecting to get a ton out of it. I wouldn't have expected you to. I, you know, You're I, not the target audience. It's, right. it's a weird thing. The, the smallest company I've worked for in the past uh, 10 years, I would say, is $30 million a year in revenue. And they have yeah. a, a totally different type of uh, marketing budget and style and needs and, and just processes that, you know, I started my own uh, business, the Freedom Business Network, which this podcast is kind of a part of. A couple of years ago, and I, when I came into it, I was an idiot because I started imitating some of the practices that we were doing in a hundred million dollar year business sure. in my little, yeah. you know, you know, barely six figure income type <laughs> startup. So, it, and it didn't work. And so, just reading this is like, oh yeah, like this is there's, it it's actually I don't have to do everything that scales. That was actually one of the things that I, I found very valuable, is that I not everything I do when I'm at this stage where I am in my business um, has to be ultra scalable to thousands and thousands of customers. It still makes sense for me to do one on one calls to get new coaching students or to sell a course or like it, the, the not scalable actions are very important in the early stages here uh, yeah. where they won't mm -hmm. be later on. Yeah, that, that's so true. That's something we went through in our business um, when we realized like, OK, there's we were trying so hard to build a scalable business and I was trying so hard to be um, Kind of like, you know, the Michael Gerber says, you know, work on the business, not in the business. And I realized like, dude, I'm not there yet. You know, I've built companies like that. You know, I talk about that in the book. Like I have built, uh, you know, my second company, we turned into, you know, well over a million dollar a month, you know, business. We had 52 employees and that company got to the point where outside of two key relationships, all I did was work on the business. I basically, everything I did was at a 30,000 foot level. And then, you know, fast forward seven, eight years later, when I started this business, you know, I was, you know, as they say, I was the chief cook and bottle washer. Like I, you know, I took all the calls. I did all the sales calls. And then we tried to build this scalable business way too early. And what we basically ended up with was this bloated bureaucracy of, of a company that didn't generate any more revenue, but spent, you know, $300,000 more on payroll. I went, well, that's a dumb idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so let's go back to the basics. And part of those basics, like to your point, was me getting on the phone with people like and I had to be OK with talking to five people and only one of them became a customer. You know, I had to be OK with me being on the phone and selling a one hundred dollar product like it's not mathematically it is not worth a 15 minute phone call for me to sell a hundred dollar product. Not in not with our numbers, but I had to be OK with that. Because mm -hmm. when you're starting off or even, you know, when you're starting off, in my case, I was in year four or five, I'm like, no, I was not there yet where I could just be like an absentee business owner. You, you may get there eventually. You may not want to get there. That's the other thing. Um, I enjoy talking to people. So, yeah, that's a good point. It's one of the things that's um, interesting. So uh, I have my my first product that I launched was Breaking Free, which uh, actually you're helping me recruit affiliates for right now. Much yeah. appreciated. Um, but, you know, I, I sold it to, I had a little list of about 700, no, 900 people, um, about 400 of which were actually opening and clicking on email. So I sold, I, I was expecting to sell about 20 of those and I sold over a hundred, which was mm -hmm. crazy for my first launch. But I, I really- That's absolutely insane, actually. So yeah, everybody, I, I feel like we should say, we should do like a verbal asterisk. Results not typical. Um, consult your physician before you launch a, uh, you know, a product. Uh, yeah. Well, okay. So a, a couple of disclaimers. First of all, I have, I, I'm very well known to a certain niche, right? Especially among copywriters. That's um, the key right there. Yeah. So I have a reputation already. Uh, you know, I built a, a seven figure freelancing career, which I was selling a course on freelancing <laughs> and I have these testimonies. I have testimonials from Steve Harvey on my landing page, right? It's like, I have a little bit different starting situation. But I was still spending a lot of time with the initial people. And, you know, I got on half hour calls just to, to coach people through the program initially mm -hmm. uh, and, and answer questions. And honestly, I was learning about my customer. Like those first yeah, hundred people are a seed thing. And I wanted to talk to people. And I found some really fascinating people. I, I talked to people who you realize instantly are never going to make it. And I, I don't mean to offend any of my customers. I've uh, actually you know. refunded. I refunded people because I was like, this is not for you. Yeah. You, you know, you're 79 years old and you have four disabilities and you're hoping to have a six figure career 
when you've never done like it's just this is not the right thing for you. But I recently got a testimonial, which is this is again, this is asterisk. I'm not even putting this on my sales page because it's too crazy. But it's uh, a guy his first year freelancing, he has half a million dollars in contracts already. And he thinks he'll hit a million dollars this year freelancing his first year as a freelancer. That's awesome. Yeah, and, I mean, you're so right. I mean, just getting this is like marketing 101. When you get on the phone with customers, again, it's a completely non scalable thing. This is the thing I found when I'm on the phone, I can't do anything else. All right, I have severe ADD. Never got the H, ironically. I'm not hyperactive. Um, you know, I, I, I've had ADD since I was a kid, completely unmedicated. I personally think it's a superpower. Every now and again, I wish I had some Adderall, <laughs> but, you know, or Ritalin or something so I could focus. Cause like even while I'm talking now, I'm like, I'm, there's a literal, this is not a joke outside of my office window as a squirrel. <laughs> I'm not joking. And I'm, I'm distracted by it. I'm like, squirrel, it's kind of cool. He's on this ledge and he's just, he's like staring at me right now. I'm, I mean, it's the most distracting thing on the world. And so that's my brain, right? And I've, I've already had a business idea since we've been talking. And, and so I'm so ADD that I actually forgot kind of where I was going with this. But <laughs> no, but like when I'm on the phone for 30 minutes with just somebody learning about them, I can't do anything else. I'm not mentally capable of also simultaneously checking my email or doing anything else. I have to focus on that call. So it is 30 minutes away from mm -hmm. quote unquote productive work. But if I ask the right questions and I shut up and listen, I learn about, I, I learn exactly what they're saying. And that's what we, you know, you know, this year in copywriting, we want to enter the conversation that's in our prospect's mind, yeah. right? You know, yeah. I think it was Robert Collier or, you know, one of the Claude Hopkins or one of those guys that said that back in the, it's one of those like universal truths about copywriting that we don't even remember who said it. Right. And so we want to do that. Well, how are you supposed to get in their mind? The only way that I know how is getting on a call with them and just listening to them and they're going to say something and it's like, wait a minute, that's the fourth time I've heard that exact statement this week. Maybe that question should be on the sales page. <laughs> Maybe those words should be on the sales page. And I'll give you a great example of that. I used to talk about, you know, recruiting affiliates, recruiting affiliates, recruiting affiliates. And when you're in the game, you know what that term means. I mean, it, it's pretty obvious what recruiting affiliates means. The problem is nobody, very few of our prospective customers used that terminology. They all said, I want to find affiliates. I want to find affiliates, find affiliates. So when we started creating content around that, you'll see, you'll see a little bit of affiliate recruiting because there's some, some, for some of our internal stuff, but like internally, we call it affiliate recruiting. We got to recruit, some, we got to recruit 10 more affiliates this week for this client. You know, that's what we say. But externally, most of our content says find affiliates and they mean the same thing. You know, there's not like a difference, but the conversation that was happening in our customer's mind is I want to find affiliates. Nobody's saying I want to recruit affiliates. It's it's interesting, too, because some of that stuff is you, some of that stuff you can do with online research. Like there is some some utility to going online and and reading Amazon reviews, yeah. although actually Amazon reviews are so bodified these days that they're almost mm -hmm. useless. It's it's kind yeah. of changed. But. Uh, there's some utility to that, but there's nothing like talking to people and hearing it come out of their mouth because you hear yeah. the emotion in it. You actually, there might be a phrase that everybody searched for, but it's kind of a lifeless phrase. And then there might be a phrase that you only hear a couple times from a couple different customers, but there's so much pain and like, like angst behind that thing that you know that has to be at least a section of the promotion because that's tapping into something much deeper than, and you're not going to find that on, you know, the internet doing research or in the forums or any of those other research methods talking to yeah. people. It's one of those not scalable things that is incredibly critical in the early stages. Yeah. Like I'll give you another example. I, I never would have thought of this as a, you know, as a thing, even though it's a part of my story, I just thought that my story was unique. My story with how I started my first affiliate program back in 2005 was we had started a company and we basically blew all of our money on paid advertising with very little to show for it. And we had, we were broke. We needed a way where we could make money before we paid money, right? No form of advertising does that. You can't like Zuckerberg takes your money before he runs your ads. Uh, Sergey and Larry take your money before they show their ads. There's no other form of advertising other than having an affiliate program where you make money before you pay money. 
All right. And so we were in such a desperate situation that just for the record, I'm going to tell you my story. And I'm going to tell you right now. I'm like a parent here. Do as I say, not as I do. Do not do what we did in 2005. It was one of the riskiest, dumbest, uh, almost, I would actually say unethical things that I've ever done. And I'm going to admit it live. Like you said, to thousands of people, we were so broke. How broke were you? No, <laughs> we were so broke. I feel like I'm like my own David Letterman here. Um, you know, we were so broke that we took the money that we made from our affiliates in those early like weeks as we were growing the program. We actually, instead of what you should do and what I do now and what I've done ever since, and I always recommend people do this, instead of setting the commissions aside, so we would bring in $20 and we're going to give the affiliate 10 just to use nice round math. Instead of setting that other 10 aside, like that's untouchable money, that's going to the affiliates. We actually had to dip into that to pay payroll. Oof. That's and scary. And hope that in the next week, we made enough 20s and, and in addition to the 10 that we now owed them that we could take some of that other 10 and, and we barely did. And we went from, in a, in a year and a half, went from a, uh, basically starting an affiliate program, no affiliate program, to a million dollar a month affiliate program. We grew every single month and we, we did like 31,000 that first month or not even that much. I think it was like 20,000 that first month. Um, I mean, it took us, you know, six months to even get to like 60, 50, 60,000 dollars. But we grew and 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 we got bigger and bigger. And so I don't recommend that just to be clear. But in those early stages, that was the only form of marketing where we could do that. It still is to this day. So that's my story. And yet I didn't think, you know, when we came along years later, that other people would be experiencing the same thing. I didn't think that one of the attractions to starting an affiliate program was that Facebook shut them down. Like, I didn't know. I'm not really big into Facebook marketing. The little we do, we've never had our account shut down. I didn't realize that's a pretty big problem <laughs> that the algorithm will just shut you down. So I get on the phone with these people. I'm talking to these people and they're like, I'm like, why are we talking? You know, I don't really say it like that, but why are we talking? Well, Facebook shut my account down eight days ago. The first person I called, you know, I emailed was you and now we're talking and Matt, I'm desperate. Like we were doing, you know, $25,000 a week and now we're doing basically zero. I need yeah. affiliates. Yeah, you do. And I started and then as I started hearing more and more of that, I'm going, wait a minute. And I started talking to more and more people who were saying, well, I'm afraid that that's going to happen. That happened to a friend of mine and I'm afraid and I'm going, oh my gosh, like the angle here is, do you want to have a diverse marketing platform? Do you want to have a way to make money before you, you know, you spend it? Do you want to have a way that has a guaranteed ROI? No other form of advertising is guaranteed to have a positive return on investment, you right. know? And so all of these things, and I started, I started hearing the same basic three to four phrases over and over again, all of our marketing just became those three to four phrases. And I never would have gotten that from looking at like keyword research because that's not what they were searching for. They were searching for how to start an affiliate program, but the core, the core pain points were these three to four things I just kept hearing over and over and over again. It's amazing. One of the things about uh, affiliate marketing too is it's safe compared to paid advertising. I, like there's no, in paid advertising, you can forget to set a couple parameters and be out $20,000 before you know what happened. Like overnight, uh, some of those- I lost $8,000 in a day once. Yeah. With, with, and when I talk about no ROI, I don't mean like I only made 2,000 back. I mean, I made zero back. And it was because- <laughs> when I set the budget, like I replicated a campaign and we didn't realize that the budget didn't, I was supposed to have a $400 limit on the campaign and we didn't realize it. And it, wait, I mean, literally if I, if it had been, if I had done that on a Friday, we'd have blown through, uh, actually at that time in my life, I would have almost been broke. I think we had maybe 35,000 in the bank and I would have spent 20, 20 to 30,000 in a three day weekend. Yeah. If I'd done that one day later, I probably wouldn't have discovered it. I mean, that's how I, stupid I was. <laughs> you know? it's, it, it can get worse than that. I had a client uh, who had a huge ad budget. They would spend millions of dollars a month on advertising, but they had a test campaign going out. So when they scale up, you scale up slowly, right? You start yeah, with oh, yeah. a, a couple thousand a day, then go to 10,000, 20. They had one campaign that was running at $150,000 a day. And they it was through a media buyer. And they sent a new test campaign that was supposed to be the thousand dollars. Let's see what works. And they put it in the parameters of one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it got a lot of clicks and two sales or something. And so they, there was a, a huge fight between the ad buyer and the the client, mm. 
because they had to figure out who was paying that hundred fifty thousand dollars because they got messed up. The the ad buyer couldn't afford to pay it on their own. It was it just that that type of stuff happens in paid media, and that's yeah. like there's not a lot of businesses like uh, this was an agora company, so they had some leeway. Okay. But nobody can afford to lose one hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's not something that any single yeah. company in the world is just throwing around. Uh, and yeah. yeah, like you said, with with affiliate stuff, that just it literally is impossible to lose money with affiliate marketing. Uh, you can yeah, you can damage your brand. You can you know you can you can make mistakes in that area for sure. But you're not going to lose money out of the gate and ruin yourself. Yeah, and I mean again, it's like people ask me all the time, "Well, does that mean every I, like all I should do is affiliate?" No, I mean <laughs> you should have an affiliate program, and. Some companies, I mean, it might only be 30% of your sales. It might be 80 and there's nothing wrong with either of those numbers or anything in between. Um, you should do paid advertising. You should do, you know, be on a podcast. You should do SEO. You should do all of the things. You should do social media, do all of the things, YouTube, you name it. But when you're starting out, I mean, like, I mean, if you're starting your business and you've got a million dollars lying around, go straight to paid advertising. <laughs> Most of us didn't or don't have a million dollars lying around. I mean, if I started a brand new business tomorrow, if you took everything away and I had to start a brand new business tomorrow, I mean, the reality is like without touching retirement stuff that I really frankly don't want to touch, yeah. I got to do, I got to kind of bootstrap it. Like, you know, frankly, because I don't want to risk the money. I'm, I'm very risk adverse when I have, you know, a daughter four years from college, you know, <laughs> and, and, and all these things like I, I'm super risk averse, you know, for the next eight to 10 years. And so I would have to bootstrap this, which means I would have to rely on starting an affiliate program. Again, got a couple million, don't mind losing half a million or more. I, great. Go do some other stuff. But yeah, I it's just. Makes sense. I would still, even if I had a million dollars that I wanted to spend on something, I would still spend the time to, at least if I was going to spend it, I'd spend that on building an email list more than paid advertising for anything else. Yeah. Uh, because you, you need to hone your message and affiliates do let you hone your message. And you get, uh, True. One, of the, one of the interesting things is sometimes you'll have an affiliate that comes up with a message uh, for their email list that was just way better hook than you had ever Happen thought of. All the time. Yeah. All the time. Uh, some of your best messaging will come from affiliates who are just trying new weird thing sometimes and you, you learn about your product through your affiliates as much as you you get customers from them yeah which is one of the lessons there uh you just gave me an idea for a podcast episode actually uh so note to self go back and re listen to the 23 minute mark of this um <laughs> you know that's exactly why i always recommend being on your affiliates email list and following them on social media uh years ago uh, back this is probably about 2016. I got a uh, I got a message. I got an email from one of our affiliates who were working on a campaign for Michael Hyatt, and I, I remember just I went, "Oh my gosh, I love this subject line!" Like it got me. You know, I was like, I opened it, I read this email, and I, you know, I was like, "Man, this is amazing." I was like, "Do you mind if I share this with you know everybody?" And he was like, "No, go ahead. You know, share it with all the other affiliates." And I did. And I shared with all the affiliates and I just, you know, I messaged Michael's team in the background, like, look at this email that Todd sent. It's so amazing. Yada, yada, yada. And they're like, oh my gosh, we're stealing that. <laughs> you know, like we're going to sort of re-navigate like, you know, 10% to the left. Right. And use some of those elements. Like it was, it was a, it was a game changer. I mean, probably made us an extra 50 to a hundred thousand dollars in a $2 million campaign. I mean, it was a big deal. We never would have gotten that if I hadn't have been on his list. So follow what they're doing, you know, look at what they're doing, even, even outside of your, even outside of when they're promoting you, watch how they're promoting other people and just, and just, you want to keep an eye on them. I mean, it's not really spying per se. It's just, you know, it's good, good practice, best practice to be watching what your affiliates are doing and learn. If we just had one, um, this time recently, we've got a client that's an AI attorney. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'd heard that the New York Times sued OpenAI and, you know, depending upon when this is released, like this is either pretty brand new stuff or, you know, ancient history in, in our timeline. Um, but, you know, OpenAI or uh, New York Times sued OpenAI. And so this guy sent an email like this is like the day after that went viral, you know, in, in marketing world. And he was like something about, um, you know. NYT sues OpenAI. Are you next? I'm like, that's a really, that's attractive right there. 
And the basic message was like, Hey, don't be like, you know, them get, protect yourself, know the law, sign, you know, sign up for Peter's free thing. Boom here, you know, got like a thousand clicks, about five, 600 opt-ins made some sales. Life is good. But the mess, and, but we realized like, oh my gosh, we need to tell our affiliates, why are we not communicating this thing about the New York Times to our affiliates? You know, it just didn't, for whatever reason, when I heard the news, where I was with my mind, it didn't whoop, click to me to go, wait, this is huge news. AI, Peter, let's send a thing to the affiliates. And so immediately we did. We sent an email to the affiliates, we wrote some new swipe copy, of course, using AI, uh, <laughs> you know, wrote some new swipe copy for them. And, you know, we made some extra money because, you know, what one affiliate did. That's great. I, uh, I, I feel like we put the cart before the horse a little bit. <laughs> um, most of the it people- went a completely different direction, didn't we? <laughs> that's all right. Most of the people that watch, so uh, for my own course, the thing that uh, in my breaking free course that people have found the most valuable is the skill stack exercise, which is finding like what makes you unique and what you can offer to clients. And yeah. I feel it's, a lot of people just don't, I think they, they chronically underestimate their own abilities, their own talents, uh, their own value in a lot of ways. So what would you say to somebody that, that they want to start affiliate marketing or they want to build an email list, uh, but they don't, they don't know what their passion is, right? It's on the title of your book. So yeah. how do you like, cause it, you, you do talk about this in the book, but we're going to walk into it yeah, a yeah. here. Um, how, how do you recommend people even start for, for somebody that's just out there thinking, I don't have anything to offer. You know, I'm just yeah. a schlub. I've worked a job. I'm just a normal person. How do you find a passion that you can uh, build a, a list or a, 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 I guess a brand somewhat around? Okay. Yeah. Cool. After this, can we talk about the fed? You know, just <laughs> <Let's do laughs> completely it. change directions uh, again. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, like you said, it, it I'll, I'll give you kind of the overview and if you want like the super in-depth, you know, version and all the stories and stuff, that's, uh, it's actually in step one, uh, midway through step one of, of the book. Um, I get this a lot. Like, well, how do I even know? Like I have some vague idea of what I'm passionate about or I've got multiple passions, you know, um, you know, I'm good at this. I'm good at that. Just three simple questions. And then I'm actually going to share what to do. If you, if you get through these three questions, this is not in the book, but I'll, I'll there's a, it actually was in the original manuscript. We had to cut like 35,000 words. So this is part oh, of what we got. So I'll give you that as well. All right. So question number one, what is it that people are always asking you for help with? All right. What, what is it that people are like, you're the, you're the guy. Um, when I started my, you know, platform, so to speak back in the early 2000, about 2011, I knew I wanted to blog. And so I had a blog about, um, leadership, personal development, things like that. And at the same time, I was running these big affiliate programs. I'd been affiliate manager of the year at that time. I think twice I've won it twice more since then. Um, you know, I'd worked with like Shutterfly. I'd built my own affiliate program from nothing to, you know, over $18 million in a year. Um, you know, won a bunch of other awards and stuff like that. And I was really well known in the affiliate space, but I didn't want to blog or podcast about affiliate stuff because I kept saying, I didn't want to be the affiliate guy. I didn't want to be the affiliate guy, but everybody was coming to me and asking me for help with affiliate stuff. And so after about four years of fighting it, um, I actually had this moment, uh, where I, I just had this like epiphany where I'd, I'd helped a friend of mine. Her name's Dana Abraham and she's in the parenting niche. Um, and I'd helped her go from about $125,000 launch to over 300,000 with her affiliates, helping her for like a month. It was a short term thing just happened by, you know, I was like talking to her. She was helping me with something. And I was like, do you need help with your affiliate program? She's like, yes, please. We're overwhelmed. So I came in and all I did, you know, all I did was like the thing that I do, I get on the phone with some of their affiliates. I give them some, you know, tips and strategies. I help them out for 20 minutes and person after person, like their top affiliate went from like 20 sales to 50 sales. One lady went from, she had a goal of five. She made over 40 sales. Another one went from zero and she was, wasn't even sure she was going to promote again. She made 17 sales, went overall from 125,000 to over 300,000 in this promotion, almost a three X return. And I mean, you know, it was amazing. And again, in the parenting niche. And then one night, this was just one of those like weird moments where I'm, I, I'm walking down our stairs and I get to like the part where it goes turns and there's this little landing area, so to speak. And this thought just hit me. I was like, we just had a really peaceful bedtime, right? We'd had this bedtime. Like if you have kids, especially multiple kids, if you have two or more kids, you know that sometimes bedtime is amazing. Your kids are like, you know, your son and your daughter are like sitting in the chair cuddling with each other and they're helpful. And then other times they're, you know, 
sticking their fingers in each other's ears. And you hear the phrase like, she licked me. It's like, what? Like she did what? You know, and they're fighting and they're arguing. It's just like, that's, so it's, it's 50, 50, right? Well, this night was really peaceful. And I got halfway down the stairs and this thought hit me. I was like, oh my gosh, there are thousands of other parents having this same experience right now. They just had a peaceful bedtime because they bought this parenting course that that's one of the things that helps them with because I taught a bunch of people affiliate marketing. And I was like, all right, I'm the affiliate guy. I changed my platform Been talking about affiliate stuff ever since. So that's number one. What is it? People are always asking you for help with. Why did I begin to realize that? Because people never came to me and said, can you help me be a better leader? Can you help me, you know, be a better entrepreneur? No, they came to me and said, how do I start an affiliate program? How do I get into affiliate marketing? The second is what are, what is it that people tell you is really interesting about you? Um, this could be like something a little bit obscure. Like, I don't know if you know the, the, the podcast, hardcore history, but oh, yeah. All right. It's my favorite. It's the only podcast I listen to. I, I, I shouldn't say that. Sorry, Tom. Um, I listen to a few of his episodes. I listen to Joe Rogan about once every six months, but I don't really listen to podcasts. It's weird. I'm a podcaster. I'm supposed to listen to podcasts. I listen to maybe like one episode every quarter, except for Dan Carlin's. When he has a new episode, I listen to the whole thing. Like immediately I will stop whatever book I'm listening to. I will stop talking to my children. I, I'm not going to learn Spanish. I'm going to listen to hardcore history for, I will stop working practically. Right. Cause I love his podcast. Number one podcast on all of Apple podcasts for like two to three days after a new episode releases. He's not a historian though. How did he end up with the world's number one, you know, podcast, the world's number one history podcast is because he would go to like Thanksgiving dinner and sit around the table and they'd be talking about something. And next thing you know, he'd be talking about, you know, Genghis Khan and how that affected the monetary policy of Eastern Europe in the 1940s. And he just, he had these stories of like soldiers on the front lines of world war one and the Celtic Holocaust. And, you know, this one guy, this like monk in Scotland who, you know, lived in a hole for three months. And he is like, he was an amazing storyteller. And they're like, dude, this is really interesting about you. So he started a podcast and I'm assuming he's doing pretty well for himself from this podcast. Cause he sells a crap. I've paid him over a hundred bucks and I know uh, there dude, are I, tens of thousands of people like me. I have been giving him $5 a month since 2000 and have you really? 2014 or something. Yeah. Dude, I mean, I, amazing. I've just bought I just, like the packs of like the episodes that are too old. That's all I've ever done. But, I just, yeah. I, w I went on Patreon or no, not Patreon, PayPal. Cause this is before Patreon even existed mm. as, as a business model. And he had this subscribe for $5. If you, if you want to chip in, uh, throw me a couple bucks. And I was like, yeah, these are better than the audio books I'm listening to. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Like the, the wrath of the con series, the, the <sighs> Ost front, the ghost like of the Ost front. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Uh -huh. And then I have, I have gone back and bought them when they take them off the, cause I think yeah. it, he puts a, he leaves them up for like three or four years and then he removes the old series. And he pulled them. Yeah. Um, and when but, I, when I started listening to him in like 2008, 17, 18, um, you know, two thirds of his content had been pulled. And after, you know, I mean, I did the normal thing. I listened to like the Genghis Khan series. I was like, that's pretty good. And then I listened to like the World War One series. I was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. So I listened to like, you know, all the, and I listened to his free stuff one time through and then like a second time. And I was like, well, I kind of want all of his old stuff. I'm just going to go buy all of it. You know, and I think at the time, you know, it was like 10 bucks per series and there was like 13 series. So I bought, I spent like a hundred, I spent like 130 bucks, you know, and that's a great business model. But it's all because people said that's interesting about it. okay the third question so first question what is the people always coming to help with you feel for it number two what is the people are saying is interesting about you number three is what did you struggle with but now you're successful at yep. um i was just talking to him yesterday dear friend of mine alan thomas um he he's you know one of the world's best weight loss coaches he's not a doctor he doesn't have a certificate that says he's a weight loss coach he has one thing that makes him a great weight loss coach he woke up one morning, weighed 304 pounds. Nine months later, he weighed 175. And so he's like, I can help other people. His entire platform initially was built on, I struggled with this. He was, he was 55, 56 years old when he lost 125 pounds. He had been overweight since he was a young teenager, 40 years. He does not attract the person who's 25 pounds overweight and wants to get in a little bit better shape. You know, he does not attract the 34 year old who wants to have six pack apps. That is not his audience. His audience is 50 year old plus men and women who have been overweight for 25, 30, 35 years. They've always been the Husky kid and they, they think there's nothing they can do. And they realize they're going to die within the next 10 years. 
Somebody else is going to walk their daughter down the aisle. They're going to be the first, mis- you know, husband to so and so, or the first wife to so and so. They can't get a new life insurance policy, you know, for less than five thousand dollars a month, and they need something, and he comes to them and he helps them. And it's all because he he knows how to do it because he did it himself. And so you ask yourself those three questions. Let me tell you the part that's not in the book because that's all in the book there. And you can work through those exercises, right? What happens if you get, you have two, you know, things, three things maybe. Typically it's two. Most people don't end up with three. But you're like, oh my gosh, people are always asking me for help with this, but this is really interesting. And I also, I struggled with both of them, right? So we have two things and you really can't pick. Like a lot of times you go through those three and you're like, oh, it's this one. It's definitely this one. That story's better, you know, whatever. Like, okay, imagine like Alan could also help you sell life insurance. He was a life, he was a very successful life insurance salesman for years. But which one's more interesting? I was in the top 2% of life insurance sales in the country, or I lost 129 pounds in nine months. That's a much better story. So, and he's passionate about it. He's not passionate about teaching people how to sell life insurance. If I called him up as a friend and said, dude, I'm getting into life insurance. Can you give me some tips? He'd say yes, but he's not going to build a platform around it and go live on Facebook three times a week and send emails five days a week and go do webinars two, three times a week about how to sell life insurance. He is just not that passionate about that. Well, and think about, that was easy think, for him. Think about the pain that he had experienced, uh, that literal fear of dying within a yeah. couple of years. And I think in the book you said, like he had a, a, a thought of like, I'll be her first husband. I'll have been her yeah. first husband. Like, that yeah, it. that the level of, of, cause that's not something you would imagine unless you've been there and actually had to experience it. The same thing yeah. with, with, with my freelance, uh, like, I, I have a story. I don't remember if I told it in the last sales letter or not, but like, I remember I was 25 years old. Uh, I had to borrow $20 from my mother to pay like the bank. So, cause I had overdrawn my account and I remember mm-hmm. having borrowed money and walking out of that bank being so broke. I was like hyperventilating, trying not to cry, thinking I had made like the stupidest decision going freelance and then to go from there to seven figures. But yeah. I knew the pain of being broke and like, thinking I just had ruined my life and I made, I quit my job and I burned my bridges and what have I done? And it's a story. Like, yeah, it, yeah. It, I couldn't, I don't think I could, you know, empathetically place myself in somebody else's shoes and tell that story the same way I can from like remembering, like sitting in my yeah. car, like I can't drive yet. I need a minute. Like that's, that's a different what, that's what level. Customers say, they say, Alan, you get me. I'm a 58 year old airline pilot. I'm 412 pounds. I, you get me they like the other alternative for this guy is to go down to the gym and there's like some 32 year old guys playing probably chip, you know, and he's, he's, you know, he wears bike short, like the little shorty shorts for no explicable reason. Smells like suit mix all the time. And like, he's going to go to him. This guy's been in shape since he was two. Yeah. Right. You know, he's had 3% body fat since he was two. What is chip going to do for this guy? No, Alan's the guy. Alan is the guy to help him because he has the story and he has the experience. So real quick, if you do have two or more, very simple exercise of this, I have done this with hundreds of people. It works what works hundred percent of the time, 80% of the time. No, it really does work hundred percent of the time. All right. If anybody doesn't get the movie reference, please get out of your hole, go watch Anchorman. Okay. So it does work hundred percent of the time though. Very simple. I want you to grab a yellow legal pad or whatever type of paper you can think of. I want you to write down your two topics. The top of one sheet, I want you to write down topic A, the other one, topic B, set them aside. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to set a timer for 20 minutes. And I want you to write down as many blog posts, podcast titles, YouTube video titles. They don't have to be thought out seven ways to or 10 ways to. You don't have to think of whether it's seven or 10. Just write X ways to, right? Write down content, ideas, things that you could talk about with no like thought whatsoever for me in a fit, like we talk about running affiliate programs. I did it the other day. I wrote down 75 new topics, not 75 topics that I could do that are repetitive, 75 new topics in less than 20 minutes, actually, because I was planning our content through 2025. Okay. That's why I did it. I just wrote down a crap ton of things for me in this world. It is so easy for me to think of content ideas there. there I mean, there's a, there's a million of them. I have five, I, I have five content ideas a day. I have more than I'll ever get to record, not to mention questions that people ask me and stuff like that to be content. All right. So you just write down as many things as you can think of in 20 minutes, then set another timer for 20 minutes, go do something else, go for a walk, something to clear your head, whatever. And then come back 
and set a timer for the second topic and write down as many as you can think of for 20 minutes. 99% of the time, what happens is they get 10 minutes into the second one and they go, I've already written twice as many as I did the other one, or I've, I can barely think of a fifth of the things I can think of on the other one. It's easy. It's A or B. Yep. Very few times have they been like, has anybody finished both 20 minutes? I've had people get halfway through the first one and go, there's no way I'm ever getting that many on the second one. I'm done. I already know it's this one. Very few times have I ever, has this score ever been like 89 to 82, you know, and then it's like a coin flip. It's always like 104 to 37, yeah. you know, because there's, there might be a subject that you're the expert in your like, fan, like I'm the expert in like small business accounting amongst my friends. I'm not a CPA though. <laughs> I, everything I've learned has been for my CPA, but I'm not going to start a platform on that. If I had to write down topics for accounting for small businesses, I'd get to like eight and tap out. Right. So just because I'm that, the, the guy that people come to, people call me all the time, friends like, Hey, you know, can I do this with my, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, as far as I know, yes. But you know, again, talk to your accountant. Right. Yeah. So you do that exercise and it just becomes so obvious what you're going to build your, your platform around. Yeah, there's a, another way to do it is um, because it's like you're saying, your brain actually, it's in there. You know what you actually should be doing. You do. There, there's this analytical part of you and the fear part of you and then the greed part of you. It's all talking over each other. You there's So I actually have a, a meditation visualization in my course because like I have you do all the writing exercises, get all this information down. And then if you do the meditation, your brain already knows it. Like you just have mm -hmm. to start imagining your future and imagine what you actually... Imagine what people are congratulating you for later that you're happy about. And that's the thing you should be talking about. It's that you have that's that passion cool. inside of you. You just have to let your, you have to give yourself permission to actually believe your desire is accurate because a lot of people yeah. don't. Yeah. I like that. I mean, that, that's, again, it's, an, it's a different way of doing the same thing. You know, I yeah. mean, that's another way. I mean, spot on, man. I mean, cause that's, that's the thing is like, it has to be something where I sell the time. Like when I, when I help somebody. Like, at least you see accounting thing. Cause again, it's weird. Cause like I said, in my circle, I am like the expert because I do know more than most about, you know, accounting and tax law and stuff like that. But when I, yeah, yeah. When I say something to somebody and I know like, oh my gosh, I just saved them like $10,000 a year in taxes. I, I get a warm fuzzy, but it lasts for like eight seconds. I'm never, I, I'm not going to tell that story six months from now. When I helped Eric Andreas go from making eighty-two thousand dollars a year to over half a million dollars a year in about five years, because he started an affiliate program, and his kid went from a crappy, his got some mild special needs, went from a crappy public school to a nice private school where they can give him basically one-on-one -on -one attention, and he got out of an apartment and moved into a nice home in a nice neighborhood and paid off all of his debts, and his marriage has never been better. Like that's a story that I'll freaking tell for the rest of my life, you know. Yeah. Those are the things that get me excited. And so it just, for me, yeah, when I, if I were to do that exercise, hypothetically, if I were to like say, you know, I'm going to start a brand new business tomorrow, I would start a brand new business. I already know where I'd end up. I'd be doing the same thing <laughs> because when I visualize like, what do I want to help people with? You know what? There's a lot of things I can help people with. Can I help them with their golf swing? Yeah. I used to be a golf instructor. I was, a, you know, one of the top 20 D1 golfers in the country. You know, I, I know the golf swing. I can help you with your golf swing. I can help them with some stuff. I can help them with, you know, personal growth and I can help them with their finances and accounting and all those types of yeah, start a blog. I don't get passionate about that. There's um, it. I think one of the, the other things that people, especially when they're, they're starting a business, they're just starting out is they worry that they're going to make the wrong decision uh, and be locked into it forever. But it's like mm -hmm. you're saying you, you were uh, a pro golfer for a little bit, right? You, you did a couple a little bit of that after college. Uh, you started in the leadership niche. You were in, in all these different businesses. Um, I guess what, what is the process of evolving? How do you know if you get into something that it's time to, uh, that, cause there's a lot of things that people quit too early on, right? Like they, they get in and they don't build their email list to a thousand people in the first month and they go, oh, I'm never going to make it. And you're like that type of person, yeah. you got to have a little more grit than that. Uh, but, but my friend, Marcella Allison calls this grit versus quit. What's the criteria when, all right, I might be off on the wrong direction and I should pivot. Like, like you ended up pivoting to uh, the affiliate stuff. I guess, how do you start uh, approaching that decision? Like what are, what are your criteria that you're looking at as maybe I'm not on yeah. the right path? I can only tell you my process uh, and, and what 
I've taught others and has worked for most of them. Uh, and and I, I share my story and kind of walk them through that and equate it to theirs. And, you know, for me, it's, it's when it's not when the work gets hard, because even right now I do what I love. Um, things that I do in my business are hard, but they have to be done to achieve the result. That's not what I mean. If it's like, I don't mean if, oh gosh, if, you know, if you're a solopreneur and you're trying to get the CSS to work on your blog so that the font size is, you know, two points bigger. Okay. That's going to be hard if you don't know that. Mm -hmm. But when the content creation, when you're only a week ahead in thinking of topics for your blog or for your podcast, when, when it's hard, when you, when it takes you three hours to plan a podcast episode, because it's not something you know very well. So I was having to do research. I don't have to research my platform. Now I do zero research. I, I spend five minutes and I think, okay, seven ways to uh, double your affiliate program in 90 days. Right. All right. Boom. I'll, I'll, I'll write, here's my script. One, this word to this thing. It's seven bullet points and that's it. Maybe there's like a note that's like, tell the story about the time Adidas made me do such and such. Right. You know, there might be like that, but it's, these are, I don't have to do research for them. I don't have to ask chat GPT. Oh, what are seven ways to, you know, I don't do that in the leadership niche. I was having a, what is my content going to be? I don't know. Okay. What are some of the ways you can do this? And I, and I actually go to, I, I had to Google some things mm-hmm. and, and I really like creating content was hard. It was a challenge for me. I could not, if I wanted to batch four months worth of podcasts in a day, I just did that the other day. I actually, re- I, my podcast is, re- let's see, I think my podcast is recorded through July right now. And wow. we're in late February. Why? Because yeah. I spent one day, phew, knocked it out. Why was I able to do that? Because it was easy for me. So when it starts to get hard, not some of the other stuff, you know what I hate? I hate doing our finances every year, but that's part of running a business. That's not what I'm talking about. When the content gets hard, when, you know, t- when talking to your prospective clients gets hard, <laughs> when you don't want to show up for a live Q and a with your students that you promise to do once a month, when that's not like, like I get fired up. I love that is the easiest thing I do. I show up, I stand here, I look into a, mo- you know, a uh, camera and I answer questions that I've probably answered 5,000 times. <laughs> and I'm not bored by it, I'm in the right, I'm, I'm right. When that starts to stop happening, it might be time to be looking at something else. The other thing I would look at is, is there a, is there a, a an offshoot or a clarification that you feel like could help? If, if you're in too broad of a niche, but it's like, gosh, you know, I just feel like all of my people are coming to me for help with specifically with uh, delegation. They need to know how to delegate. The, my most popular download is a delegation template. Or I, I'm, I'm making this up off the top of my head, right? Right. Maybe you should just become the delegation guy. And everything should be around delegation. If you're in too niche of a thing, like, okay, um, you know, you're, de- you're teaching, it's like weightlifting for arthritic women over 70. <laughs> right. Actually, that might not be that narrow. I could ask <laughs> yeah. probably about 2 million people. Um, all right, but you get the idea, right? What if you expanded it a little bit, just a little bit, and, and you know, and, and tapped into some other stuff? So I start looking for those signs. Those are like the signs that I that I see when, when, when people come to me. They're coming to me not fatigued because of the results. They're coming to me because of the – just fatigued. They're just burned out with the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And then I look at, okay, is there anything you can, if it is the results, then what can we fix? You know, what's broken? Is it that you don't have enough leads? Well, are you, are you growing an affiliate program? Do you have an affiliate program? No. Well then start one, you know, start, like start getting some new people into your, you know, into your business, start getting some new leads. Like how do we get an affiliate program just to send 10 people a day? You know, that's, that's a good starting point. And you start to see those numbers grow. If you do have to transition, um, I mean, general, I'll, I'll tell you how I did it and what's worked for our clients. Again, I can only go from my own experiences. Uh, what I did was I told my audience. Now, you talk about a little bit of a shift. This is not going from arthritic 70-year-olds talking about weightlifting to including 60 to 70-year-olds. That's not a dramatic shift. You don't even have to announce that right. to your audience. I went from teaching leadership and personal development to 
teaching how to run affiliate programs and do affiliate marketing, like big shift. There actually is some crossover though, because most of the people that were learning the leadership and stuff, they were small business owners mm -hmm. and they ran, they were marketers who were learning how to build their own business there. So there's actually some crossover and I lost very few people probably, I mean, to this day, 40% of my list, and this is, you know, almost 10, almost a decade later, 40% of my list is people who actually joined from way back when, you know, <laughs> that's pretty cool. That they... Um, we lost less than 20% over the next year, which is probably 15% of that was natural attrition. I would have lost 15% if I continued to talk about leadership and personal development. So I really only lost probably 5%, you know, for because of the change. So I just told them, I said, here's what I'm going to be talking about and here's why. And I shared my story and my authority and, you know, I can talked about the awards I'd won and all these things. And I invited them to stay with me. You know, I just said, Hey, if you want to learn, if not click here and, and you'll be off and you can unsubscribe. No big deal. No hard feelings. Wish you all the best. Um, but yeah, most people stayed. And so I just told them what I was going to be talking about. And, you know, a lot of people I'm sure stayed for a, a month. Uh, kind of curious about that. And then, you know, after a month or two, they were like, that oh, was not for me. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't like, I, I have no interest in doing that. I'm a, I'm a middle manager that came to him for advice on how to be a better leader, you know? So you just announce it and roll. I've, I've had a very strange, uh, list journey. So I started my list originally started building an email list in, I don't know, 2015. And I just, I was a copywriter at the time. I only, I, I had spoken at a bunch of events. So I was like, hmm. well, what am I doing with all this attention? I might as well build a copywriting list. I, I had an yeah. autoresponder that went for like two months with a bunch of lessons. And then I maybe mailed it once a year announcing where I was speaking next. And then I I got to the um, the part where I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to retire from copywriting and I'm going to really focus on like my own business. This is time I can launch my own thing. I have enough credibility or I'm tired enough of copywriting clients that I want to do this. And I started building, I, I kept focusing on the copywriting, but then I start. I went to Tom Woods. I spoke at his uh, school of life event and I, I did a talk. I did a talk on freelancing because I thought, you know, it's a libertarian audience. They're not going to care about the, the writing part, but they'll really care about, you know, working on their own terms and, doing all it and yeah. my God, that went over amazingly. And everybody wanted to talk to me about freelancing. So it's kind of actually what you said earlier is like, what do everybody want to know from you? So that's when I decided to, to build this course on freelancing. But then I started talking to, uh, you know, I had a couple of the libertarian presidential candidates on my podcast and I did these somewhat political type emails. I've just been confusing the hell out of my list, basically uh, <laughs> too broad. And, you know, enough people trust me that it's not shrinking that fast. But I had this one subject line, um, why progressivism is disease or something like that. And man, did I lose some copywriters on that. The people that just did not want to hear anything. I, it, it was it was a bad idea to send that email. But I've been, you know, I just got back from the Tom Woods mastermind. Uh, and we really focused my business in on what it should be. And I'm actually yeah. going to double down on the freelancing because it ties into everything. Like the thing I am passionate about, and this is one of the things I really liked about your book is like digging into what you're passionate about. I'm passionate about people like actually living life on their own terms and freelancing is the best way that I know to teach there people to do that. And it really does incredibly change the quality of your life. Once you know how to do this correctly and have a pipeline of clients and actually get paid what you're worth as opposed to what a client's willing to just pay you. Like I can get fired up and talk about that all day. So I got to stop confusing the hell out of my list with all the, yeah. the libertarian stuff. But it's, it's a learning. I mean, you don't have to be perfect to start is what I'm saying. It's like, I'm narrowing back in. I don't think I've lost enough people that it matters. I can still grow from here. People stick with you. If they see you're passionate and care about what you're talking about and you're still providing value along the way. So I just, I don't want people to think they have to come in and be perfect or that this is going to be a terrible, if they have to change, it's going to ruin their business. Like you said, you kept so many people because they like you. They, they got to know you and trust you. Yeah. So and, and I mean, there's an argument to be made. I mean, it, it would not fit for me. I don't believe we'll, we'll actually we're going to find out cause I got some stuff coming out, but you know, there's something to be said that if it's, you know, if you do kind of throw the libertarian stuff in there and people are like, ah, rah, rah, you know, I'm at, like, mate, I don't know. Like, were they ever, were they ever going to be really a great client? And, and for every one of them, was there somebody who was like, okay, Henry is my guy now. Like he is the guy I follow 12 people but he's the guy, you know, I mean, there's something to be said for that. I mean, I remember years ago when I think it was after the, the 2018 midterms 
feel like, yeah, it was 2018 midterms. Uh, when the Republicans lost and the Democrats took over the house, I think, or I don't remember exactly what happened, but, and I wrote an email that was just like, it was, I, it was like, you know, election results was the subject line or something like that. And it just said, Hey, if, if you're spending today in mourning or spending today in overjoyed celebration, you're both wrong. Like the reality is this doesn't affect you that much. And the real power is in you, the entrepreneur. And of course, uh, not a single <laughs> Republican wrote back and said, you're right. You know, <laughs> they all, they all wrote back and, or they, no, wrote back and said, you're an idiot. They all wrote back and said, amen, you know, spot on, love it. And of course, like, you know, 10 or 12, like, you know, left loony lefties wrote back and were like, it, you know, like, do you have any idea how like the Republicans are going to start world war three? And I'm like, no, they're not. I mean, <laughs> I, it's just, that's just not true. You're an idiot, you know? And then one of them like went, I mean, wrote like this, you know, long email and, and, it, you know, and I was like, I, I clicked on her one everything. I was like, I, I just responded back and said, you follow AOC on Twitter enough said, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that was like the thing, but it was like 10 people out of, you know, at that time, like 18, 19,000 people, you yeah. know, who wrote back and were angry about it. And if, you know, the same 10 or 12 people, they're probably not on the list, but like people are like, I'm unsubscribed. If that's your position in life, that you would unsubscribe. One lady who'd been on my list for 19 months and open, had like a 42% open rate, and I'm presuming got value. But because I said that one thing that you disagree with, that means that you're not going to learn anything else. And this could potentially cost you tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars. If that's the choice you're making in life, well, you're an idiot. I mean, just by definition, you're literally an idiot. <laughs> Like I follow people, I completely disagree with their politics. Completely, sure. like they they could be a neocon or darn near a socialist. But if they have good marketing, I follow them because I'm I want to learn from them. You know, I, that's how I'm smart. I don't care about. I don't get offended. I literally just don't. That the only way you could offend me is to insult one of my family members. Anything else, don't really. You could say Ron Paul's the devil. And I'm like, all right, whatever. I, mean, I don't really care if you think that. <laughs> like. It's, I like I the guy. Don't care. <laughs> yeah. I have I have a very good friend who donated uh, the maximum amount possible to Kamala Harris's presidential campaign. Like, <laughs> and he's still a very good friend. We don't talk about politics because that goes yeah. nowhere. But like in everything or else, or anything intellectual. I mean, I'm just being honest. Like, you know, just. <laughs> it's it's the shame. The thing is, he is actually extremely extremely smart. He's just he's got these beliefs that are they go back to some events in his life that are are. Whatever. Fair it's, enough. Yeah. It's fine. It's so yeah. we talk talk about I've everything else. But... My best friends are like that. Um, yeah. and yeah. you know, we can still we we'll still be friends and get along. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. I've got a I've got a podcast episode coming out in like six to eight weeks. Uh, and it's called If Donald Trump was an affiliate manager. So <laughs> and and you know, here's the truth. I really am just looking for an excuse to stir, stir things up a little bit. That's I, the genesis of the it's actually I will tell you this. It will be the single best, most impactful podcast episode for anybody who will, if you hate Donald Trump, if you get past that and listen, there's actually three things out of, out of the seven, three of the things that I share that are, I don't know, I wouldn't say groundbreaking. They're taking principles from the real world and applying them to affiliate management, but they are things that I don't think I've, I'm pretty sure I've never talked about them and I don't believe anybody else is talking about them in the affiliate management world, Right. And it's because like, this has given me the opportunity to, the truth is the subject line or the title of the podcast Kate was one of those shower moments. It was just one of those, like, what if I did that? And I was like, you know, this would be a fun way to piss some people off, <laughs> but also I'm like, you know, I'm going to do it. And I messaged our operations guy. I was like, Hey, I have this idea for a podcast. Is this a really bad idea? He's like, nah, he's like, I forget what he said, but he was like, it, it's, it's clickbaity, but it'll, it'll work. You know, so we decided to do it. And and here's the thing. There are some great lessons. So when I see something like that, I like hypothetically, you know, if I, if I saw something like that and it was like, okay, you know, if Joe Biden were an affiliate manager, right. You know, he'd work from like 10 AM to noon, take some naps, watch Matlock and go to bed. It'd be a two hour a day job. But that's not the point. So if it, I guess that would be the thing. If I were to write it, do an episode about how, if Joe Biden were affiliate manager, how can you do affiliate management in two hours a day, <laughs> you know, um, and not be able to speak in a, a coherent sentence. That yeah. would be the, the, so if I were, if I saw that as much as I can't stand, I might be like, 
all right, maybe there's a lesson to be learned from that. There's a reason why they chose that. Let me listen to that. And I can I, learn from that. So I, I'm curious would, to see how it goes. <laughs> I would certainly, it, it like if Joe Biden was an affiliate manager, it, you make it sound like it's the easiest job because if, if a dementia patient that doesn't know where he is half the time can make money doing this, so can you. There yeah, we go. One like hour in and we got to it, didn't the we? The hook works there. You know, it's actually amazing. I have this, I always, I write down topics just in case, uh, you know, we, I don't know where the conversation is going. I've crossed off two of these things and we've been going Joe at this Biden, for an hour. Joe Biden dementia, one of those Joe, things? No, Joe Biden no. dementia was not on here. I mean, there's a lot more stuff we could get to, but it has been an hour and I, I feel like we should do a round two at some point in the future. Uh, Let's because do it. We'll do you it. got you got a lot of great stuff to share. But in the meantime, where can people find you uh, right now? What's the best place to go? Yeah, I know you have a lot of resources. So Golly, yeah. the the all right, um, just so you know, the audience we're looking at is uh, freelancers or people looking to create more freedom and independence in their life. What's the best resource yeah. that you have for the, those people? You know, marketing one hundred and one, one call to action. So I'm going to give you two. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote a marketing 101 book and yet I'm going to violate. It's like in the book, one call to action. I think right. that's on like page 212, just to be clear, somewhere around there. Uh, all right. So if you, if you want to check out the book, uh, again, it's a great resource for anybody. And there's tons of bonuses uh, that you can get through this. Like you can go to Amazon, you can walk into a Barnes and Noble. It's in, you know, 85% of the Barnes and Nobles in the country, all that fun stuff. But passions into profits book.com forward slash Liberty. Okay. Passions into profits book.com forward slash Liberty. When you go there, there's actually some extra bonuses. I forget how much like four or $500 in extra bonuses you can get when you go through that link. Um, so go there and get all the bonuses and, uh, you, you know, get audio book, Kindle book, you know, physical book, whatever. I don't know what other versions. I think you can even get it on CD, believe it or not. It's like, who, who listens to CDs anymore? But the, my publisher did produce some. I think all. I think 99 of the 100 they produced are probably still in a warehouse. But whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, and the one was my grandmother. Um, and then the second thing, if you're looking to, uh, you know, possibly like, okay, you're listening, you know, you're listening to Henry, but you're kind of at that more advanced level and you want to. Um, maybe start some, you know, doing some affiliate program stuff. Maybe think about getting some affiliates for whatever you're doing. Even if you're just starting out, uh, go to mattmcwilliams.com forward slash first 100, F-I-R-S-T-1-0-0. Uh, mattmcwilliams.com forward slash first 100. I'll show you how to get your first 100 affiliates there. All right, beautiful. Totally okay. so the book put, is not free, admittedly. Like, it's not free. So I'll put yeah, both right. of those links in the show notes here. And uh, man, I really enjoyed this conversation, Matt. Thank you so much for coming on. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. Stay free. <laughs>